good evening and welcome, uh, students, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. We are absolutely delighted to have Tom Carruthers uh, with us here today. It's of course a special treat to have Tom at the School of Public Policy as a distinguished visiting professor. Now Tom doesn't need much of an introduction at this university, but if there's one that I'd like to tell you about is that only a week into his course, it was last year, uh, last fall, student enthusiastically referred to his class, and I quote, an absolute must. And I know from this year, this reputation has only multiplied and grown as our student numbers have grown. And as Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, Tom, of course, is a very, very influential <coughs> voice on issues of democracy and international democracy support, and his voice has and continues to shape U.S. foreign policy, the international aid community, and also the academic debate in this field. And so, Tom being always a pioneer in this field, his latest project looks at non-Western roots of international democracy support, and more specifically, the role of rising democracies as they are becoming key players in the global democracy promotion. At the same time though, developments in the Ukraine and all the way to Hong Kong, and of course also including in this country, Hungary, show that it's not at all clear whether democracy as a concept of social and political organization can actually maintain its appeal. And so one of the questions becomes just how much do we in the West actually understand the full complexity of this process and the implications of the new global marketplace for political transitions. And so, as many of you know, to promote an open debate about these and other questions and to examine the strengths, but also the weaknesses, and this is very important, and I repeat the weaknesses of liberal democracy and the appeal and dangers of illiberal democracy, CEU, CEU has launched a series of events entitled Frontiers of Democracy, and this lecture tonight is a special highlight in this series. To lead what I hope will be a very vibrant discussion tonight, I'm very pleased to welcome also Julia Buxton here with us tonight. Julia is an incoming professor of comparative politics, and she's an expert on democratization and transition processes, on post-conflict recovery, peace and security norms and gender with a special regional focus on Latin America and in particular Venezuela. And moreover, while drugs is not on tonight's agenda, Julia is also an expert on the global drug trade and its implications and has a particular interest the impact of national and global drug policies on development, peace building, poverty as well as human rights. So Julia, thank you as well you. for joining us tonight. Tom, again, thank you for being here and I hand over the floor to you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Wolfgang, for that nice introduction, and thank you, Julia, for agreeing to serve as moderator today. It's great to see particularly uh, not just friends, but many former and current students here as well, some of whom are worried I will call on them in the middle of the lecture. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or test them about it afterwards, but I, I promise not to do that, at least initially. It really is a pleasure to be associated with the School of Public Policy as it grows and becomes an essential part of CEU and an essential part of the broader international policy landscape. After the fall of Hosni Mubarak in Egypt in February 2011, Western, both European and American democracy supporters began arriving in large numbers in Egypt was the first, along with Tunisia, and to some extent Burma, the first such kind of exciting transition in some time since really the early years of the 2000s, which had been part of a bigger wave of democracy going back to the 1990s. As they arrived, they, <coughs> they found a different kind of landscape than many of the landscapes in which they had worked in previous years. <coughs> to start with, they found very uncertain reception on the part of Egyptians who were unsure that they really wanted a Western model of democracy. They wanted something. They wanted political change. But they were 
some deep sense unsure about what model of democracy they wanted because of their perception of troubles with the model of Western democracy in Europe and North America. They were also deeply unsure whether they wanted Westerners there to help them achieve whatever it is they wanted to achieve. It was not hard for them to wonder where all those Westerners had been during the long decades of dictatorship. And they knew where they had been, on the side of dictatorship for the most part. And so they were skeptical about the intentions of many of those actors who suddenly arrived saying, a new day in Egypt, a new day for the West as well in Egypt. But not just these things uh, represented a different landscape. The Western democracy supporters arrived, who arrived soon found that a number of other actors were there, busy, intensely engaged in trying to shape the trajectory of Egyptian politics. The government of Turkey uh, was there, already with good contacts with the Muslim Brotherhood, and seeking to encourage a more active and forceful role for the Brotherhood in post-Mubarak politics. The government of Qatar was there as well, also making contact with different political Islamists, the Brotherhood as well as others, including Salafist actors. Over time, as the Egyptian transition began to move and to take different forms, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates were there the very substantial presence after the ouster of Mohammed Morsi last year. Both Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates contributed more than $10 billion of assistance to try to cement this particular change in the Egyptian transition. And so both the United States and Europe have found themselves at times out outweighed and outthought and outacted by actors from other places with other intentions, other methods, other agendas. It's not just in Egypt that this has been the case. <clears throat> in other parts of the Middle East that have been undergoing transition in these years, a similar story has unfolded. In Bahrain in the spring of 2011, as the Shia community in Bahrain began to assert itself, and Bahrain entered into a very tense state of division, conflict, and protest among the different actors, the United States tried to weigh in to broker an agreement between the ruling family and the protesters. But it found itself again uh, very active involvement from Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, who sent in military forces directly into the country to help beef up the government and its negotiations and, in a sense, its crushing of the Shia movement. In Libya, <coughs> as rebels took up arms against uh, Gaddafi, uh, Qatar was one of the main early suppliers of weapons to the, to the rebels. It was an influential actor. In Yemen, as the government of President Saleh began to fade. The United States and, again, Britain in this case, tried to help broker an agreement to negotiate a different kind of government that might emerge. But they found themselves, in some cases, outweighed by the actions of Saudi Arabia, which has extensive political networks in Yemen, as well as a deep aid relationship. Iran, which had contacts with certain groups who've emerged in the last year. The Houthis and others who played an influential role and so in all parts of <coughs> the emerging Arab Spring, and then most notice, notice, noticeably in Syria, as the Syrian civil war began to heat up, it, had, it turned very quickly not just into a brutal, ruthless civil war, but a proxy war for international actors seeking to influence, in a sense, shape its outcome. With Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Iran, Russia, and others all playing a role in trying to shape the course of the Syrian war as well. Now, <clears throat> it wasn't just in the Middle East that we began to see a very different picture of international influence and political transitions. In Burma, as I mentioned, a country which also entered into transition in 2010 and 11, many powerful, important actors outside of the West, China above all, but Japan, which is a major contributor to uh, Burma's economy, to its aid position in the world, uh, <clears throat> became more influential in some ways. India. Norway, the European Union, the United States, Great Britain, and the other countries I mentioned, all there trying to shape the outcome of the Burmese transition. <coughs> in short, what I think we're seeing in the world, what I've called as the title of this lecture, is a, a new envir international environment for transitions, an environment in which there's a multiplication of actors with very different interests trying to affect the trajectories of transitions that occur, what I call a new global marketplace of political transitions. Now, of course, to some extent, this isn't a new phenomenon. Uh, powers around the world have always tried to exercise influence on their neighbors. But I think what we're seeing here is something both quantitatively and in certain ways qualitatively different. <coughs> 
in the number of actors who are engaging, in the number of places where they're engaging, and as I'll talk about in the methods that they're using. Now, <coughs> let's start this broader picture by framing the era of transitions in which we're living. As you know, starting in the late 1980s and early 1990s, we, the international political scene moved into an era of attempted democratic transitions, or transitions away from authoritarian rule. And we developed our own, in a sense, cognitive lens for this landscape of seeing the world as attempting a larger transition from authoritarianism to democracy. That era of transitions, though, began to ebb in the late 1990s, and by the early years of last decade, the advance of democracy in the world had stopped. And it is noticeable and notable that there are no more electoral democracies today, at least by Freedom House's measures, than there were at the start of the century 14 years ago. There has been no advance of democracy in the world in the last 14 years overall. This is no longer an era of global democratic transition. Yet it's still an era of transition if we understand the word transition to mean something other than a fixed path from authoritarianism to democracy. If we step back and take the word transition in a very neutral sense as a, a country which is in a state of fundamental political change or potentially fundamental political change which affects not just the particular government that it has but potentially the political system that it has, then we find that many countries in the last 10 or 15 years are in transition even though we don't know the direction or the ultimate destiny of those transitions. So we find, for example, that there are still some countries that are exiting authoritarianism and do seem to be attempting in a plausible, perhaps substantial way, democratization. Tunisia is such a case. Burma may or may not be a case, depending on how the transition goes. But we are also seeing countries that are exiting from authoritarianism and heading directly into a breakdown of order in which the ultimate direction is completely uncertain. We have to put Libya in that category, a country which left authoritarian rule and in a short space of time has ended up not just in a confusing and fragmented civil war, but a state of profound uncertainty about what the future of the country will look like if it remains one country at all. In addition, we have a number of countries that entered transitions 10, 15, even 20 years ago, away from authoritarian rule, but they remain unsettled, <coughs> in which their, their political direction is still uncertain after all of these years, and they seem to have entered into some kind of chronic transitional state, if you will. Nepal is such a country, a country that has been through agonizing political change over 20 years, including civil conflict, the ups and downs of a monarchy, <coughs> the ups and downs of different political parties and attempted constitutional Pakistan is a country that seems to live in a chronic transitional state, going from military rule to civilian rule, and now questioning of the validity or legitimacy of civilian rule and uncertainty about its future. The Democratic Republic of Congo left authoritarianism in the 1990s, but today, 17, 18 years later, finds itself devastated by continuing civil conflict and war, and no particular end or even direction in sight. In addition, we have countries that seem to be consolidated democracies that we had, had on our transitional map and put over in the category of they made it. <coughs> um, that it, suddenly the bottom dropped out and it's not so clear that they did make it. Mali, for example, was long held out by the international policy community as one of the rare examples of an African country that had made it look like a settled transition to democracy until suddenly it didn't. And suddenly Mali was facing fundamental conflict this country, Hungary, was on most people's lists of countries that had achieved a democratic transition. Yet we heard a speech this summer uh, by the prime minister of the country saying that it has a different political direction that's not that of consolidated democracy. In addition, we have uh, <coughs> regions which, if you take all of these things together, have become zones of, in a sense, intensive transitions. This includes the Middle East where more than half the countries are at this state politically unsettled. This is particularly startling in a region which until 2011 was known for its political stagnation and stasis, in which Arab specialists, specialists of Arab politics had really no experience in studying political change because there had been so little change there. Today the region is, is fraught with political change. South Asia has become, an, again, an intensive transitional zone with almost every country in the region, 
exception of India, in some sort of state of political flux. Substantial parts of Southeast Asia, now including Thailand, <coughs> Burma, Malaysia, and others, in potential states of political transition. And of course, the western end of the former Soviet Union, Ukraine, Moldova, possibly Georgia, possibly other countries, still unsettled in their political destinies. And not just those regions, but in a sense all over the world. So we exited one era of transitions and entered another almost without noticing it and almost without understanding how profoundly different the framework of this different era of transitions is than the previous one. Because we're still using the same language, the same word, transitions, for lack of a better one, but often not just the same word, but the same mindsets and the same methods for trying to relate to countries in this state. Now, to analyze the global marketplace, what I'd like to do is just go through the three main categories of state actors, which I see engaged in it, acknowledging that there are, of course, important non-state actors as well, multilateral or <coughs> multi-state actors like multilateral regional organizations, important private transnational actors, as well as non-state actors like uh, Islamist rebel groups or radical groups that operate across borders. So there are many other actors, but today I want to focus on the three main categories of state actors. Let's start with undemocratic states, which <coughs> have been involving themselves more and more and more and more seriously in the last 10 years in the transitional trajectory, not only of their neighbors, but of countries further afield. Some of these actors and their actions are well known to us. Russia, for example, as part of its policy of trying to ensure a sphere of influence around it, a sphere of countries that are, in a sense, politically and economically and security terms friendly to Russian interests, has been exerting itself when any of those countries seem to be entering a transitional state. Russia weighs in. Obviously, that's on our minds because of Ukraine, but the events of Ukraine of the last 10 months uh, are only the latest chapter in a very long story of intensive Russian engagement over the years through economic relations, through political ties, through direct political funding of candidates and parties, through media campaigns, through the use of media penetrating the Ukrainian sort of informational space, and so forth. <coughs> Kyrgyzstan, Russia has acted at different times in Kyrgyz, recent Kyrgyz history to assert itself in different ways, such as in 2010, when Russia, feeling less and less pleased with the Kyrgyz government, acted in various ways economically and in diplomatic terms to help rattle uh, the cage of Kyrgyz politics and contributed to change there as well. And we could go about the neighborhood, whether it's Moldova or Georgia or elsewhere, and find other examples of Russian engagement and transitions around it. So that's a case that I think is well known, particularly here in this community. There's also Iran, similarly well known. For years, Iran, as part of its foreign policy position in a difficult neighborhood, had sought out very close uh, friendships with certain, in a sense, ideological partners, above all Hamas and Hezbollah in Lebanon, but also with the government of Syria, uh, not an ideological partner, but a useful partner to it in its own ideological position in the region. But then as transitions began occurring in the greater neighborhood in which Iran lives, it dived in as well and has proven to be an actor, a transitional actor of considerable application and skill. If you study the engagement of Iran in Iraqi politics, since the ouster of Saddam Hussein. It's a remarkable story of deep, persistent, and in some ways effective engagement in trying to shape a transitional outcome using deep sociocultural ties between elites in the two countries, advisors, agents of influence traveling across borders, direct political contributions of money to political actors, funding and organization of military groups, and much else ending up as by far the most influential actor in Iraqi, Iraqi politics today. In addition, Iran also began engaging much more actively in Syria when Syria entered a transitional, if you will, state starting with the rebellion in 2011. And Iran again showed itself an actor of considerable application and persistence in that endeavor. Saudi Arabia, another actor which we tend to have on, in our minds or on our list of countries that have been asserting themselves more and more in these ways. For a long time, Saudi policy in its neighborhood was one of promoting stability because it was a region of stability and stability suited Saudis 
Saudi interests. But as Saudi Arabia began living in the neighborhood starting in 2011 that entered into a whole series of interconnected transitions, again, the Saudi government shifted gears and proved itself to be, in some ways, an adept actor in engaging in these transitions. As I mentioned, uh, in Egypt, with significant contributions of assistance, in Syria, with less success, but considerable force, in Yemen, in Bahrain, there isn't really an era of transition occurring today in which both Saudi Arabia and its often partner, the United Arab Emirates, are not deeply engaged in trying to affect the outcome. Of course, in a different part of the world, Venezuela, uh, starting in the early 2000s, again, as part of a larger foreign policy of trying to create a kind of, to some extent, ideological network or alliance structure in the Americas, including the Caribbean, uh, began looking for opportunities when countries in those regions appeared to be entering potentially transitional states to weigh in, particularly in election campaigns in which there was a fundamental choice of direction that the country was facing and a candidate who Venezuela felt represented its interests. So thus in Bolivia in 2005, Venezuelan contributions to the MAS, and Evo Morales' campaign. In 2006, Nicaragua, Ortega returning to the power in that country, Venezuela playing a role. In Peru, with Humala in 2006, again, Venezuela deciding it had a role to play through political financing and other measures as well. So some of the cases, Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela are well known. Others are less well known to us. Qatar, for example, a country that, <coughs> including myself, most people can't pronounce uh, correctly, uh, has proven to be an international actor of remarkable influence, considering its size, and an actor whose agenda is confusing to many people. It has a multifaceted sort of quality to it, which has puzzled observers, but which does have a logic. Uh, Qatar has engaged deeply in supporting moderate Islamist actors in certain countries, like Egypt <coughs> and uh, Tunisia, in which it's doing so in part as a balancing act with its own domestic political stance in which, out of concern of showing domestic Islamists that they really do have a royal family that doesn't seem very committed to Islamist policies, does have a commitment by supporting those abroad, a sort of a clever balancing of its own domestic precariousness through entrepreneurial foreign policy. But then, in Libya, Qatar moved quickly and decisively to assist the Libyan rebels, and Qatar has been deeply involved in Syria supporting different rebel groups as well. Ethiopia, a country again that doesn't make the news very much as an international actor, very influential in Somalia, uh, trying to shape political outcomes in Somalia through the use of military force, essentially uh, military intervention into Somali politics uh, at various times and a continuing engagement in its neighbor. Rwanda, of course, with its engagement in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, as well as other countries in Africa that don't tend to make the top list of such actors. And then, of course, some are well known but <clears throat> poorly understood, and I would put China in that category. We know that China is engaging much more in the world and its foreign policy is more assertive, more influential, more consequential. Yet, we have a hard time, in a way, settling an analytic view of what really are China's intentions in, in many cases. For the most part, China has been an actor which seeks and rewards political stability in, in other governments because of the needs of China's uh, sort of economic policies and the desire to have stable and productive economic or commercial relations with a number of governments. And so in many ways, China's policy, whether it's in its immediate neighborhood with Cambodia or Sri Lanka or in Africa and its relations with Angola or South Africa or others, China is deeply invested in building you know, deep, <coughs> productive, mutually productive uh, relations that have both a political and economic character to them. Yet, where China begins to bump up against ongoing transitions, China, too, shows itself a transitional actor. Ever since Burma began moving in 2010 and 11 towards change, China has not been taking what it sees as a potential a geopolitical threat uh, lying down. China has thought carefully about its relationship to the different actors in the Burmese transition. It's opened up uh, dialogue and active contacts with the NLD and with Aung San Suu Kyi. It has essentially gone on a charm offensive with different Burmese businessmen and other actors in the country trying to reposition China in the country in order to maintain its influence 
in important ways. When we take this larger picture of the non-democratic countries and their international actions in transitions, a couple of things are striking. Well, first, I hope, how numerous they are and how diverse they are, ranging from Rwanda to China, from Russia to Venezuela. Secondly, how assertive they are, the kind of tools they're using, the amount of military force, as well as military funding and sort of active military engagement is striking, whether it's Rwanda, Russia, Iran, Qatar, many of these countries are quick to use military means to affect political transitions. In addition, some of them, particularly those with ready cash coming from abundant natural resources, are investing directly in political campaigns, large amounts of money under the table to keep politicians who could be friends. They're doing so fairly shamelessly and actively in a number of such countries. And third, What's also striking is their motives are complex. There's a tendency among some analysts when seeing this emerging world of non-democratic actors asserting themselves to say, oh, this is autocracy promotion. There's democracies over here, Western democracies that promote democracy in the world, and then these countries are autocracies, so they're promoting autocracy. I think this is a major mistake to put it in those terms or to think about it in those terms, both because democracies don't always promote democracy, as we know, and so why, in a sense, should we assume that autocracies always promote autocracy? Countries pursue their interests, and their interests are not always easily boiled down to simply establishing or reestablishing autocracy in a particular country. So, for example, the <coughs> support for uh, by Iran for the Syrian government is clearly anti-democratic and does support a non-democratic regime. Yet Iran's role in Iraq, I wouldn't describe as autocracy promotion. In fact, Iran has often been not exactly a partner, but alongside the United States in trying to urge certain, certain Shia politicians to do certain things. And often there's a kind of quiet convergence between the goals of the United States and Iran with respect to the arrangements of, of Iraqi politics. Similarly, Qatar's role in Libya, Qatar was in effect a partner of NATO in Libya. So you have an autocracy promoting something in Libya, but clearly not autocracy promotion in those terms. And so although it's tempting to try to boil down uh, the framework, in a sense, the landscape into simple categories, doing so confuses more than it enlightens. <coughs> Let's look then at the second group of actors. These are what I call, or people call, the rising democracies which are democratic states outside of Europe and North America, which have been growing economically and increasing in importance in international terms in the last 10 years. And as part of that process of change, are asserting themselves more internationally. And as they do so, asserting themselves in transitional contexts around themselves as well. These countries are often torn between a traditional attachment to non-interventionism. Some of these countries, Indonesia, India, Brazil, South Africa, are traditional stalwarts of the non-aligned movement, which had non-interventionism as one of its cardinal principles. And instill in their formal foreign policy declarations, in their actions, in many multilateral fora, they stand for principles of non-interventionism. Yet when you look at their foreign policies, you see increasing interventionism, uh, depending on how you define it, but I would say in terms of searching for influence in transitional contexts. Brazil, for example, has engaged in trying to head off or resolve attempted coups in a number of Latin American countries, such as the coup in Honduras in 2009, where Brazil was very actively engaged diplomatically in trying to resolve that conflict. In Venezuela in 2002, the attempted coup there where Brazil entered very quickly as a negotiator trying to broker an agreement, and in other cases in the region. In addition, Brazil, in, since 2004 in Haiti, has been leading the multilateral effort of political reconstruction in Haiti, and Brazil is the lead actor in this multilateral effort. Brazil has been involved in ongoing negotiations in Venezuela between the opposition and the government to try to avoid a political meltdown in that country. Brazil is starting to give electoral assistance farther afield in Guinea-Bissau, Timor-Leste. You see Brazilian electoral advisors doing the same kinds of things Western electoral advisors have done for a generation. Indonesia, a country with a very cautious foreign policy, yet Indonesia's largest diplomatic exercise is the Bali Democratic Forum. It's a 
specifically ideological approach to defining the position in the region, an attempt to support democratic norms in the larger ASEAN community, <coughs> something that Indonesia puts a tremendous amount of energy and effort into in its diplomatic life. In addition, you see an organization like the Indonesian Center for Peace and Democracy, which has a commitment to promoting democracy in Asia, actively carrying out political training sessions with people from Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, other parts of Southeast Asia, and further abroad as well, reaching into Egypt in some cases. India, a country again with a deep sort of public attachment to the norm of non-interventionism, outside of the West has been one of the most influential actors in Afghan Afghanistan's attempted transition. India very committed to the success of the Karzai and now the successor government. Uh, again, <clears throat> in this case out of a a deep perceived strategic need that happens to align with the principle, which is democracy, very much how the West often defines <coughs> a, an engagement both in terms of direct strategic interests and political principle. And India has been engaged in Nepal, off and on in different ways as well. And then Turkey, another rising democracy, which since 2011 in the Arab world has been one of the most active external actors trying to shape Arab transitions in ways I've described not very successful, uh, meeting a lot of difficulties and questioning within Turkey about this activist foreign policy. But others, South Africa, Chile through its human rights work, Ghana through some of its work, peace building, South Korea through a much larger development program, and other rising democracies are starting to be consequential players in transitions in many places. Now when we look at this second group and we look at a few general characteristics of them, compared to the first group, one thing that's striking is just how unassertive they are compared to the assertiveness of the others. The tools they use, they almost never resort to military means. They almost never resort to the kind of secretive, substantial political financing that others engage in. They're much more cautious and hesitant by comparison. Most of them still seem to feel torn between the traditional attachment to non-interventionism and uh, interventionist policies, and they have uh, awkward discussions in their own capitals about these issues, about even defining really what the principles of their policies are. And the third notable characteristic is, even though they're democratic countries, and what they're doing in most cases is pro-democratic, they're very hesitant to partner with Western democracies. They're skeptical of Western intentions and agendas. They feel they've often been on the receiving end of Western hypocrisy and political meddling. And so even though many in Western capitals hope that these countries will be new partners in the broader international democracy support endeavor, there's a great deal of hesitancy on the part of these governments or these countries in, in partnering with the West. The NATO intervention in Libya, for example, was anathema to the governments of South Africa and Brazil, heavily criticized in those countries and in international fora, and many other points of friction as well. And so they may appear as partners to some, but have not proven so yet very much in practice. Then that leaves us, I'll be briefer here with the third category, which are the Western democracies, which are still out there <coughs> and are still active. Now, <coughs> obviously, there's a great deal of democracy support carried out by Western democracies. But at many times, and I would say increasingly in the last five years, the West feels the sort of familiar, but once again growing tension between the desire for political stability in some countries versus a willingness to support change. We've seen this like a quickly shifting wheel in the Arab world where an impulse in 2011 and 12 to be on the side of Arab political change has in a sense frozen up and started to back away in places like Egypt and Libya and elsewhere in the region where political change now looks frightening and conflict producing and not fitting well with a larger strategic agenda in the region. And you see, of course, the endeavors in Afghanistan and Iraq over the last 10 or 15 years having absorbed, soaked up, in many cases wasted, such enormous quantities of resources to such uncertain sort of ends or uncertain results that, of course, Western policy communities are much less likely than they were before to dive into major engagements. Yet despite that, France is still involved militarily in Mali. The United States and a number of other NATO countries are still involved in Afghanistan. They've gotten newly involved in Iraq, in some ways and in Syria. 
And so we shouldn't take over seriously the idea that there's an interventionist fatigue on the part of the West and they simply have backed away from the world. Western governments are out there. Western democracy support measured in simple monetary terms continues and in fact continues to increase. Western democracy aid has more than doubled in the last 10 years. It's over $10 billion a year now. It seems to continue to grow. Even though many people have the impression, I'm not sure why, that it's shrinking or that they're backing away. There are more programs, more actors. New institutions are still being created. The European Endowment for Democracy last year, a number of other uh, such institutions have been created in the last several years as well. So what picture overall emerges from this analysis? We see a world in which we have one group of states, non-democratic states, acting in the ways that I described. We see a second group of non-Western democracies taking a greater and greater role in very different ways, but, but still often decisively. And we see the set of actors we're more familiar with that have been out there for 20 or 30 years, deeply engaged in transitions, also acting. Well, I think we reach a few provisional perspectives or conclusions. The first, I hope that at least impresses upon you by just the enormous level of activity. Every transition that now occurs in the world soon finds itself engulfed by outside actors seeking to shape it, to control it, <coughs> sometimes to determine it. And it is striking that at a time when we're coming to grips with the fact that many governments are trying to limit Western support for democracy or rights or civil society development in their own countries, and we feel, in a sense, a surge of sovereignty coming from a number of countries, those very same governments are much more interventionist outside their own borders. And so <coughs> the level of you know, commitment to certain principles has radically reduced in these years. And the closing space phenomenon that I, I and others have written about is occurring simultaneously with this other global marketplace. And it's a very confusing picture that has disoriented, I think, a number of people. Russia, Iran, United Arab Emirates, Venezuela, these are leaders in the closing space phenomena trying to say it's illegitimate for one country to politically meddle in another as they're busy politically meddling in the affairs of their neighbors. More generally, the idea that <coughs> I see some policy analysts, particularly the realist community in the United States, holding forth that, that this is the era of the return to sovereignty after a certain sort of post-Cold War softness and laxness about sovereignty that people are putting back up the barriers. That's an illusion. Sovereignty has never been so beaten down, so interpenetrated, so much thrown into question by events as it is now by the kind of activities that I have talked about. In addition, this growing global marketplace is reaching our own borders, entering our own societies. Now, many Western democracies are not in states of transition, but when we see winds of political change arriving in our own societies, they now often have attached to them influences or voices from abroad as well. The recent surge of far-right parties in different parts of Europe was immediately followed by analyses showing that these far-right parties have different kinds of international associations, associations with other international actors that would like to play a role in the changing nature of European politics. We see it with Islamist actors who are reaching directly into Western societies through recruiting methods uh, to have an influence on political thinking in communities in the West and political responses of the West to the issue of the place of Muslim communities in their own societies. Another conclusion, simple terms, this is a, a domain, it's a lawless domain. It's like the high seas. Uh, there are no rules about in the global marketplace of political transition. It is a bazaar in a classic sort of middle age kind of sense of a market not ruled by any standards, principles, or norms. Countries, governments do what they want, where they want, when they want, how they want. So my central message, and I'll close with this, is that the United States and Europe <coughs> have been struggling to get beyond a transition paradigm and thinking about processes of change and how they define political transitions in the world. We need to make a parallel transition away from a, a paradigm of transitional support. We've had a paradigm which is that there's a thing called the West which radiates out political influence to the non-West. And the question has been how effective, how active, and so forth are we at <coughs> in that domain. That's gone. We now live in a world where it is not the West radiating out 
systems and processes and ideas to the rest of the world. The world is like a, a cell phone cacophony with a million transmitting signals out there all penetrating each other. We're just one of many actors trying to influence transitions. And so <clears throat> in a simple sense, we need to get serious about seeing the world as it is. Move away from these embedded mindsets that we have about our role. In a sense, up our game to meet this more challenging environment. Moving away from transition, transitional paradigms is painful. It's difficult and slow. But if you're behind the curve, you pay the price. Thank you for your attention. Look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much, Tom, um, and thank you to Wolfgang for the uh, introduction to, um, to my arrival here in January. Um, this was a really fascinating talk, and obviously I've missed the time that you've been here. Um, I have lots of questions for you, but that would be very selfish of me. Um, but I'm sure a lot of people here have questions. Before we go to those questions, though, the key thing that really struck me about the talk that you gave, Tom, was that everything was about countries. Maybe had we been talking about this a decade ago, we would have been talking about regions. So my key question to you is, what's happened to the Africa unity? What's happened to the OAS? What's happened to the EU? Why is this very much couched in terms of states for you? I intend to uh, couch it both in terms of states that are relatively powerful within their regions and are therefore often dominant regional actors like Brazil or like Russia, but that are not intending to be global actors. Uh, and therefore, you have regional norms confronting regional heavyweights. And usually these regions have been attempting to articulate some kind of normative framework, like the OSCE or other parts of the broader European normative framework that these regional actors, in some cases, confront and in some cases clash with, like Russia's continuing clashes with that both normative and institutional framework. In other cases, like Brazil, they, in a sense, consider themselves on the side of that normative and institutional framework, yet being a regional heavyweight, like any heavyweight, they want to do things on their own terms and their own ways, rather than, in a sense, submit themselves to, to regional practices in some cases. So I do think, you know, I do think the regions are important. But we also see countries stepping across you know, regional boundaries for influence. Brazil doesn't seek to be a global player, but Brazil does have interests in Africa, both you know, traditional sociocultural ties with some countries, and also a desire to be something more than just a Latin American power. Uh, China, of course, is a, is a global player and a global actor. Um, and so we see a confusing mix. We see regional heavyweights that are both with and against, in a sense, regional normative and institutional frameworks. We see regional actors that are reaching out beyond their regions. And so I think regions are very important in this world, which has moved away from the idea of a global institutional framework, yet the actors within it have complicated relationships with these regional realities. And how do we account for the United States? That, I mean, the quote really from you was outweighed and outthought. Hmm. How do we understand the failure of the US to anticipate these type of changes, to learn the hmm. lessons from earlier failures in democratization? One of the reasons is simple. <clears throat> like if you compare the role of Iran in Iraq to the role of the United States in Iraq, Iraq is really, really important for Iran. They don't have a lot of other places where they, they very much want to affect the transitional outcome. The United States is overwhelmed its assistance programs, its diplomatic capacity by the sort of host of, of challenges around the world. And you simply, simply sometimes have a local actor which is very determined and has the kind of local resources in terms of both knowledge and ties and the ability to move resources and material in ways very informally. I think the United States finds itself in many regional contexts up against regional actors who care a lot more know a lot more, can bring local resources to bear. Mm -hmm. Has anybody got any other questions before I hog? Thank you very much for your uh, very stimulating summary of the world that we live in. Uh, my name is Emma Lakchola. I'm an assistant professor at the International Relations Department of CU. I wanted to raise a concern about this uh, still uh, this, your use of this uh, transition as an analy analytical framework, because you seem to criticize it, that the way that we look at tra transition, but 
you do not want to dismiss it. So you think that this transition, sh you know, the, the kind of the concept should, st should stay there. But uh, when you look at these countries, like the Tunisia, the post-revolutionary countries in the Arab world, where I'm also conducting research at the moment, they have an allergy towards this uh, concept. They don't see themselves in transition, and they don't want to be evaluated, uh, because uh, it assumes that there is some kind of a linear type of development to, towards progress. And that's kind of the Western straitjacket. So either you are in, I mean, the way that you are looking at it and you kind of made a summary, we are evaluating these, all these countries, this country in transition, this country is not, there. So I mean, it's a kind of a, don't you think there's a kind of a, a Western straight jacket? Mm -hmm. I understand that if we leave this concept, I mean, maybe there's a concern that it will lead to some kind of an anarchy because there may be different models in the world and uh, what emerges from these models may be, may be something that we, would, we don't like. But maybe we need to accept that there is no, there are disjunctures, discontinuities, there are different type of emergent structures in each society, and these type of lead into different uh, ways of, uh, you know, so why don't we to move towards that? I mean, what do you think about that? That I want to I think I have accepted what you say, but I'm stuck with the word transition because I haven't found a good replacement. I was trying to redefine the term transition to say it is not a descriptor of an assumed transition from authoritarianism to Western liberal democracy. Instead, it is a descriptor of a country which it seems to be in political flux or fundamental political change which involves the invention of a new political system different from the prior one. But the word transition just triggers in you you know, the, the idea that I, I can't do that so quickly or it's too loaded and we need another word. I mean, we could just use the word political flux. Libya, you know, Libya is in political flux. Tunisia is in political flux. But then some people say that sounds, that sounds chaotic and uncertain and uh, what's better than that, you know, Tunisia is actually moving forward. It's not a Western transition. So it's hard to find the right word. But the word transition got loaded up with a lot of assumptions. But the word itself actually isn't bad if we accept a very neutral idea of transition as a state of change from one thing to another, even if we're not sure what the other is. Do you have a word that you'd like to put on there, the table? I mean, I just want to say that it's OK. It's not just about the word. It's the mindset. I that think I'm it's challenging the mindset. The mindset. It's not just <laughs> this word or that word. That's the problem. It is assuming there is some kind of a linear development that we all follow. And if we follow, there's a toolbox. And everybody follows that. We are going to lead to one certain direct, you know, end. And this is the, this is, I'm, I'm saying that using the word transition and evaluating it kind of assumes that type of linear uh, development. That's but I'm trying I'm to challenging get, that. Hold on. <laughs> I'm trying to get people precisely to do what you're asking. I'm mm -hmm. trying to get a community which has schooled in a generation of thinking about transitions to recognize that both that way of thinking about political change is not helpful. And secondly, that the attached methods that go along with supporting change mm -hmm. that are built on those assumptions are also not helpful in this world. So you're, you're making my case. You're just finding it annoying that there's still a lot of <laughs> no, I mean, no, I'm, I'm assumptions <laughs> out there that you feel have not been stripped away. This lecture is an attempt to contribute to such a process, not reinforce it. That's good. OK. This is one next to you. <coughs> uh, hello, my name is Andras Bozoki, professor of political science. Uh, it was an interesting conversation between Emil and you, um, and I agree with you that the old uh, application of transition is uh, is simply not working anymore. However, the notion of transition implies that there is a direction, right? So there is not just simply a country is in flux or there are unstable political conditions, but there is a move away from a certain point to another point. So um, even if we don't say that they are moving towards Western democracy, but there is a direction of the movement uh, from the given point. It is more than just um, you know, a country being in flux. And my question is that what can be the non the attractive non-Western models for future transitions. Um, Putin or China or um, what sort of models? I mean, it was announced that you, you just started a new uh, research project on non-Western models of, uh, of democracy. 
or political regime. So which of them can be attractive for some other countries, neighbor countries to follow? Is it Erdogan's Turkey or Putin's Russia? Or do you see some alternative rising uh, models in the world to the Western type or illiberal democracy? What, what kind of regime uh, is in, in your mind? Certain political leaders and the systems attached to them have been attracting a lot of attention as holding out the idea of being alternatives, whether it's Putin's Russia or China these days or Erdogan's Turkey. Those have become, in many parts of the world, metaphors that people invoke for the sake of, you know, saying that we want something different. I mean, the idea that, you know, a small landlocked African country can, quote, follow the China model is, doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you think about what the Chinese economic model rests upon, whether it's several hundred million laborers, you know, working at a low wage and a system of ports and a mandarin tradition <coughs> of the state, and you say to the small landlocked African country, we're going to follow the Chinese approach. So they're, they're metaphors in many cases, which are metaphors of resistance to the idea of an imposed model. But I think in countries that are struggling <coughs> with change and are trying to define directions like Tunisia, it isn't really a question of Western liberal democracy versus illiberal democracy. It's, you know, concepts of dignity, <coughs> justice, pluralism, openness, which they would like to work out in their own country, which might involve, for example, different kinds of negotiations between religious institutions and religious principles and the political state that exist in, in certain Western countries. Now, that's not necessarily Arab democracy or Islamist democracy. It's just different. It's Tunisia's <coughs> approach to reconcile different forces and factors in Tunisia. What I really see, at least in countries which I think are seriously searching, is more, I, I wouldn't use the word fragmentation, but an individualization of the idea of trajectories or models, if you will. And we're, we're overswayed by the fact that some charismatic leaders simply invoke these <coughs> metaphors and say, you know, we should be like these countries, when any simple analysis of that country says <coughs> that's actually kind of ridiculous, that we're not at all like those countries in, in major ways. But I think, you know, if you go <coughs> whether you know, Brazil itself is trying to be Brazilian democracy, which it does view as having certain traditions it would like to develop with certain kinds of social pluralism and social solidarity that it views as different from at least North American democracy and certain traditions. It, again, these are often mythical ideas, I think, but they're, they're ideas that are important of inclusiveness and certain sort of differences about the treatment of the individual versus the community and heightened individualism versus heightened communitarianism. And so there are a lot of political debates in a lot of countries about how to reconcile the general human drive for justice, dignity, pluralism, openness, participation, et cetera. So I, I think the debate over is it going to be this model or that model is a, not only a false debate, but it's a misleading one when you look at the finer texture of what's happening in more places. My name is Andrzej Gram, I'm a student of political science, and <coughs> my question was concerned uh, Western strategies and democracy promotion. So you invoked a few de recent developments, and my question is if the difference between American and European approach in democracy promotion has changed in the last few years, or the decades long settled uh, paradigms are more or less untouched recently. <coughs> Some Western actors are on autopilot and are doing the same thing over and over again. I won't name them because they're <laughs> recording this lecture. Um, others are, are searching and are looking. I was in Egypt last week, for example, and I met with people representing a, one European important actor in the civil society domain. I want to mention the particular country because it's touchy there about who's doing what in Egypt. But this actor, which is an important European donor, have redesigned their civil society support in Egypt so that <clears throat> they will no longer bring any Western experts, trainers, advisors, and they have set up a program of working with Mexican, Brazilian, South African, et cetera, experts on civil military relations, election monitoring, and so forth, and all of their assistance will go to those people to come work in that country. It will be, quote, Western assistance, but they've decided to think seriously about how to de-Westernize it. And this is one approach. I'm not saying it's good or it will work, but it's different. 
And you see people trying to do things like that in different places. You also see, I would say, in the more thoughtful ends of the civil society assistance community, uh, more attention to the idea that you know we're we're going to move away from a community of NGOs that have long-term Western grant support that may still be part of what we do or part of a process of civil society development, but we want to see much greater attention to organizational forms that can live off of the land in a sense and much greater efforts to cultivate societal engagement and support for civil society. People are looking for ways to do that. So for example, again in Egypt, uh, actually not much Western investment into this, but some other actors have been working on a, a crowdsource, crowdsourcing mechanism for civil society in Egypt, which tries to get out of just social ventures and charitable ventures to do crowdsourcing for Egyptian NGOs that are doing somewhat more sort of political work, but would live entirely off of Egyptian money through a crowdsourcing kind of mechanism. And this is not something, again, 10 years ago, we were so busy sort of working on civil society assistance and trying to get it going in many difficult places that people knew this conversation was coming about alternative forms and greater sustainability, but now we're being pressed to do it. So there are, there are signs of change around, but they're scattered. And they're, in a way, a lot of the large ideas are, have not changed. I was recently in a country to the north of the United States, um, <laughs> which, you know, I was there and I was a guest and I was talking with officials of that government and they were saying to me, you know, what we want to do in our democracy support is, is the world needs to understand our political model. Um, and in it, that's a political model which isn't the ugly United States, it isn't sort of the, the bumbling European Union, it's a, it's a successful country in some ways and one with less ideological baggage, so that's an appealing idea. And I said, <clears throat> uh, you know, I disagree. You know, Africa is not looking for the Canadian model of democracy. That's, you know, Canadian model is, has many benefits and many advantages, but again, if you're in Kenya today, you don't, you know, in a sense, what you're not trying to do is get the Canadian model. Um, that instinct, and sometimes, you know, Americans always get accused of thinking and acting in that way. But in some ways, the temptation is even greater if you're from a smaller, more appealing, more successful democracy in some ways, because you think your model is better compared to that of the behemoth to the south. And so the instincts, some of the old instincts to export models or to think that we have answers, which you know, democracy support is about taking an answer from here to there, are still deep and they're hard to get over. But in a sense, by, by force of experience, uh, I think there's no choice. <coughs> Just going back to that point that you just raised about this West European country which is now focusing on its civil society promotion, delivering that internally through domestic actors. Through humanitarian work and various NGO related projects, the problem that you tend to see with that approach though is anybody who's ever tried to apply for a grant with a West European government knows that it usually requires a very high level of literacy, it normally requires much schmoozing at the local embassy and embassy mm. functions and it mm -hmm. probably requires a PhD because these are so complicated and then we have log frames and reporting requirements. Mm -hmm. Is the danger not, I can see the point, mm -hmm. the, the benefits mm. of delivering this locally but is the problem not going to be that we're just going to hand this over to effectively local level elites who mm -hmm. are invariably mm -hmm. Western educated and not necessarily representative of their societies. Not that there's anything wrong with being Western educated, I'd just like to emphasise <laughs> that point. Mm -hmm. But it's a bit of a dilemma, isn't it? I mean, we did see this in Egypt before. So how do we get, you know, the rural poor into these kind of mechanisms? How do we get women into these mechanisms? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I mean, returning to this particular case, this government, I think, has been there a while and is aware of some of those problems. And so they have all of the staff who handle the process are Egyptians. So there's no language requirements. There's the ability to travel locally within the society and meet groups outside of Cairo easily. The grants are small. This is a in a sense, a separate European government with nothing to do with the European Union institutions. And so they have negotiated their own framework agreement with the Egyptian government that allows them to fund directly without going through Egyptian ministries, which is unusual because of that. So they, you know, I think they've thought about some of those problems. Those things are certainly still there. But in general, the effort to create local foundations, if you will, or re-granting mechanisms have gotten caught up in some of the problems you say, just exporting the problems to the next local level. But again, if thoughtfully done, can get around that. I mean, the Open Society Foundation, some in risky territory here, you know, have struggled with 
you know, how well do local national foundations work? How much do they reproduce bureaucracy from the center? How much do they represent a de-bureaucratization and localization of assistance? And at least some of them, you know, have done some good things that it would have been impossible to do from a central bureaucracy. Absolutely. Have we got any more questions for this? Sorry, just got my friend here. These are my students who want to know about the paper that's, <laughs> that's going to be due. Um, yeah, about Nepal. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But, okay, I'm Louis from the School of Public Policy, and my question is, uh, I was mentioning in, your, in one of your classes about, in Latin America, we, we say that in every country there is a potential Chavez. So, any time uh, the country can turn. So, what has been done, or, um, or where you're talking about opportunities, but actually what has been done to actually protect territories and actually not to lose and not to take for granted consolidated democracies? Well, it's not just, you're right, Latin America faces the particular uncertainty about the health of what appear to be consolidated democracies because as we've talked about in class, Latin America has, still has the highest level of inequality in the world as a region. And therefore having pluralistic systems in a region of very high inequality puts you constantly at risk of populism and, and the overturning of certain institutional structures for the sake of a wave of direct demand on the system to redistribute and to, in a sense, overturn traditional checks and balances. But it's not the only region or the only sort of set of countries that faces this. I mean, given the general I would say crisis is too strong of a word, but the general rise in many parts of the world of citizens who are tired of the pluralism they have and feel that it's not delivering the kind of representation of interests they want and therefore seek to, you know, more direct action in some cases, whether it happened in Thailand and ended up leading to the coup there, <coughs> various things in some countries in this region as well, has put the democracy community on notice that it's somewhat uh, uneconomic approach to thinking about democracy support, which was focus on rules and processes and political institutions, and they will take care of economics over time, is insufficient. You know, 20 years ago, if you went to the National Democratic Institute in Washington or the Republican Institute or any of the other standard democracy organizations and said, what's the role of economics in your work? They would have just said, we think more democratic governments will get countries richer over time because look, uh, the, the 40 richest countries in the world are mostly democracies. And so it's going to work, trust me, just get, get democracy, it's going to work. They wouldn't say that anymore. They would say, well, this is complicated. And they would say a lot of the countries we've worked in are at risk because of the, the deep dissatisfaction citizens have. And so they have started to think a lot more about, for example, when they do political party development training, they don't just say, let's get a party that has these sort of traditional political characteristics. They work from the beginning on how do parties understand poverty reduction and what are the comparative ways of thinking about poverty reduction within different types of parties. Or when they do parliamentary strengthening programs, from the beginning they try to insert, if we're going to do budgetary training, how do we focus on access of information to budgets that are useful for local communities. So they start to build in socioeconomic features into what were traditionally very political programs. But again, it's changing, you know, it's changing the character of what they are. Some of them feel this is a dilution of what they do and that should be for the World Bank or, you know, socioeconomic aid organizations. But the community has faced this reality, as you say, that there's an underlying fragility to many quote transitions or even consolidated democracies because of that fact. Well, I think also, just to add, the, I think the point that Luis raises is really important in this issue about the inequality because, you know, I think the big challenge is to understand that the United States isn't a homogenous actor and there's lots of different interests in the US scenario who are kind of involved in democracy promotion. So maybe, you know, if we have this kind of leadership in terms of changing paradigms, but mm -hmm. when you have institutions, as we know, like the National Endowment for Democracy, and then what goes on on the ground, NDI and IRI and all these kind of different layers, mm -hmm. is it going to be possible for the US in the future moving forward to have a kind of coherent approach mm -hmm. to democracy promotion? And I'm thinking in particular, leading on from this, of somewhere like Cuba. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a really worrying scenario, I think, in terms of the stabilization of Cuba going forward and these conflicting interests around democratization and the message that will send out to the rest of the region in terms of how that transition, which is a word we don't like, um, is actually negotiated? No. Um, to your question. <laughs> uh, no, there will not be coherence. Um, because, for two reasons. One, as you say, 
many different actors which have different institutional approaches and traditions. And there is a kind of marketplace of democracy support actors, not just within the United States, but within Europe and the other countries that I mentioned. And so there's simply too many different actors. And there's been the idea that good work will win out over time, in a sense that people will try different things and what's effective will take root and be reproduced and what isn't will drop away. Um, unfortunately, because a lot of assistance is supply driven rather than demand driven, that doesn't happen and some bad programming just continues because the supply continues. But secondly, I don't think that will happen because in a sense, coherence would uh, imply that we really deep down know sort of what we're doing or how to do it. It will imply a level of knowledge that we, I don't think we can achieve or is achievable mm -hmm. at all. And so, you know, if Cuba starts to enter into a political transition, if it hasn't already, um, we won't, despite all of, you know, our experience and study of other processes of political change or transitions before, it'll be very, very difficult to know what are going to be the key elements, how are the economics and politics going to intersect, what will happen to the reconstitution of the ruling party, how will traditionally marginalized sectors re-enter. And so the, the implication that we, we will know enough to have a, quote, coherent approach is, is probably beyond us. What we have to hope is that there's, um, you know, in a sense, uh, a bit more communication and coordination among, which we see, for example, in Burma, not happening as much as it should. Actors rush in and bump each other out in crowds. So we need you know, better coordination. We need better information for the people in these transitional contexts to understand the outsiders who come to them and say, we want to help. There's still remarkably few efforts to engage the people in those settings and say, a bunch of foreigners are about to arrive at your airport you know, carrying briefcases called democracy support. Here's what's in those briefcases. You know, get ready. Because we just sort of, we don't make it our job to sort of help the other side of the process. So, so there are things we could do to lead to greater coherence, but um, it, it would be more the work of some smaller, smarter, more nimble actors that would try to facilitate that rather than any larger picture of coherence. Mm -hmm. Because Cuba, out of all of these countries, I mean, we've got Russian interest, Chinese mm -hmm. interest, American interest, Venezuelan interest, Brazil interest. Every country you've mentioned in mm -hmm. your speech today is basically going to be embedded in what's mm -hmm. happening in Cuba, aren't they? I mean, last night <coughs> I was having a conversation with somebody who knows a lot about North Korea. And I said, well, should I, I my first question to him is, should we start thinking about democracy support programs in North Korea? Is North Korea about to enter? You know, we don't really know what's happening in North Korea. But there's a X percent chance that something drastic has happened, and you never know in a very brittle regime, sometimes things surprise you. Now, probably not going to happen, but is the, quote, international community prepared to engage in a thoughtful and well-planned way in a North Korean transition? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for an interesting talk and a brief overview of democratic support. Um, my name is Dursun, I'm a second year student at School of Public Policy, and I guess I have two questions. First is, uh, first one is related to your previous talk about this coordination of different actors promoting democracy. Um, I spent the summer in Myanmar, and it was an extraordinary experience seeing how there are un uncoordinated actors trying to promote the same thing most of the time, and uh, it makes local community, in most cases, very frustrated and un unhappy. Um, and in some countries, we have realized that uh, in some cases, it's actually maybe even better not to go to there and try to promote something from the first place, because in some cases, things get even worse than it, they used to be. So I guess my question is related to, um, do we, the international community, have to run into the countries to try to promote certain type of um, system, let's say democracy in this case, or should we wait for the countries that are undergoing transition to come and ask for help, what kind of specific assistance they need, if they need our advice at all. Um, and the uh, second uh, question is also kind of linked. Should we, because you've, you've mentioned so many different actors trying to do different things, uh, should we try to limit what these countries, different actors trying to promote? Um, because some countries are providing military assistance, some countries providing uh, financial assistance, others providing political assistance. Uh, should we try to limit to what extent they, these countries can support and what kind of assistance they can provide? And if yes, how? Thank you. Uh, taking your second question first, 
Um, I don't think the we you're using can do that. I don't think we have the power to limit China's actions in Africa. Yeah, we can certainly try to enter into a productive discussion of China about forms of international aid and say be part of larger conversations institutionally about learning and international aid and maybe if we were a bit more forthcoming with the International Monetary Fund and its governance structures make China feel more a part of some of them. And so there are ways to shape the actions of certain actors. But as we see with Russia and Ukraine, if we say to Russia, please stop doing that, you know, they don't they don't do it. So so I don't think we have that power. And secondly that or so that leads to your first question, which is should we step back and wait? What I'm talking about is the very problem that because there is such a greater and more intensive global marketplace, standing back and wait no longer seems like an option to us. In, in Burma you know, or Myanmar, there was the feeling that there's this historic opening and it's very much about the changing position of China and the country and the idea that the West would just stand back and say, here's our telephone number, our email address, let us know when you need some help. Just isn't how, you know, People, people respond to such a situation, both because of interests and also because of habits about assistance. And so um, I think, nevertheless, what you're getting at is a deeper, you know, is the basic need for smarter and better assistance, which tries to, to go and to actually listen in genuine terms and not impose agendas and to say, you know, that sort of good aid practice, that's hard enough. And, you know, I'd say parts of the aid community have gotten a little bit, or in some cases, somewhat better in, in not you know, imposing aid, but actually making aid a facilitative <coughs> sort of factor. But that's a much smaller venture than what you're describing of as a sort of wholesale shift. The lady in the blue jumper. Thank you. Um, thank you for the lecture. My question is directed to the issue of the rising um, democratic states as actors. And I'm a bit skeptical about some of the actors you mentioned, for instance, South Africa. I get the impression that it's actually more acting as a state which is a, a toothless bulldog when it comes to promoting uh, democracy. In particular, I have the case of Zimbabwe when it had to intervene. So I don't know if you could maybe comment on this and, you know, these rising states have various capacities, so. Well, <clears throat> for 30 years the world has been saying to the United States, you're inconsistent. Critical. You do one thing in one country, you're in bed with the Saudi elite over here, and you're supporting democratic change in Tunisia. How do you make sense of that? South Africa, as you know, um, she's from Zimbabwe, by the way. Uh, South Africa, as you know, is is has a certain position in Zimbabwe due to sort of traditional linkages from the 1960s and 70s of political elites. It doesn't have those in Cote d'Ivoire and the Ivory Coast, and South Africa has played a much more pro-democratic role in the Ivory Coast, where it has been actively engaged in, after the stymied elections a couple of years ago, South Africa was one of the key diplomatic players in trying to resolve the impasse. And so South African foreign policy, like British policy or US policy or French policy, is inconsistent in both in its principles, and therefore it's consistent that it pursues its perceived interests, but that leads to inconsistency in terms of principles. But I don't think that should, I can understand why your perspective, South Africa's position in Zimbabwe has been particularly disappointing, both because Zimbabwe is such a clear-cut case of a government that's driving its country off a cliff, both politically and economically. Uh, and South Africa has the means to have some influence on that. So it is a particularly disappointing case. But that doesn't negate the fact that South Africa in some other places, both in regional mechanisms and some other specific countries, has been on the other, sort of on a more positive note. Leila Grashkovich, Professor, Political Science Department. So my question is, um, why is it that the expansion of uh, liberal democracy has stopped 15 years ago? Uh, do you see some structural reasons, be they uh, world economic or world political, or is it that a bad policy of, of democracy promotion backfired, or which reasons in what combination? Tom, can we just get a couple of questions Please. together? Sorry, we've also got a couple more down here, so can we just, this gentleman here, do you have a question? It's a microphone there. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> So my name is Galen, I study public policy here. And my question is that if these transitional marketplaces are indeed marketplaces, 
what the role individual non-state actors play in creating marketplace disruptions. For example, the rapid expanse of ISIS, the role of even someone like Edward Snowden playing a significant change, the amount of transparency that does also impact, in my opinion, democratic processes. Or even an individual like George Soros and the amount of funding that can be brought from individuals through foundations or through other mechanisms to influence significant change inside these transitional marketplaces. If maybe you could speak to the role that these non-state, and even in some cases, individuals can play in changing this and shaping this marketplace. Thank you. Okay, um, Bella, thank you for the question. That's, uh, that's kind of a big one. It's uh, <laughs> a good question. Um, I think there are a couple of reasons why the expansion of democracy stopped. First, the main impulses that led to the expansion in the 1980s and 1990s reached their natural limits. And so the impulse to overthrow uh, one-party regimes in Africa caused a lot of regime change in Africa in the 1990s. But that impulse wasn't strong enough given the underlying structural difficulties in a number of African cases of, of achieving consolidated sort of pluralistic or democratic change, that that impulse went as far as it could after about 10 years, and then you then had a series of very problematic cases. You had <coughs> essentially a third of African states that were reasonably democratic, a third that were not at all democratic, and a third that were in conflict. And not a steady state was reached, but that, that impulse had gone that far. And that same story occurs region by region in terms of the impulse. The only place where that's different is Asia, where the impulse, Asia is a larger, more complex, more heterogeneous region than all of the others. And therefore, it's harder to trace and say there was a single impulse in either South Asia, Southeast Asia, or East Asia. And so it's a more complex domain, I would say. Secondly, um, <clears throat> in a simple sense, the, the easy cases were done. And what you had left were either hardened dictatorships like North Korea or some others we could name or adaptive, clever ones like Zimbabwe uh, that were able to absorb the normative change coming in the third wave of democracy without being unsettled, either because they had shielded themselves from it or they had learned to be sort of clever and adaptive. And so in a sense, those cases that could be toppled by that wave were toppled. And then third, I think you, you also had, this is, this is complicated because it's, it's not a simple relationship. You had changes in the international economic sort of environment, which also began to change things in the last decade. The 90s were a period of quite a bit of growth in many parts of the world. And the 2000s were a period of, of differentiation of growth, I would say, at best. You still had considerable growth in some middle-income countries, in some parts of that. But you, you no longer had an economic dynamic leading to a political dynamic. And then I guess if you had to add the fourth, I'm just sort of making these up. But if you had to add the fourth factor, um, the start of the last decade was also the imposition of a new strategic framework in Western policy of counterterrorism, which is very different than supporting democracy. And although the language stayed the same in US and Western policy, there were deep interests that push the US and other countries to be friendly with security establishments, in some cases non-democratic leaders and a number of governments for the sake of the counterterrorism campaign, very different from the 90s when you didn't have such an overlay. Um, with respect to your question, Galen, uh, yeah. I agree. <coughs> it's, uh, I mean, one of the clever and sort of semi-irritating phrases that Tom Friedman uses, um, he has many of those, uh, is semi, what is it, super empowered individuals, you know. That's the sort of, that's like the people he has to dinner on weekends at his house. Um, and um, uh, he's right, there are some individuals who have accumulated, you know, a lot of power uh, through a lot of resources which they use uh, in different kinds of ways. I mean, George Soros is an interesting example of a super empowered individual. Though what strikes me, <coughs> and it's a source of great frustration to me, there are a lot of billionaires in the world. I don't see, other than Bill Gates, I don't see maybe one or two others, Pierre Omidyar and a few others, I don't see many billionaires using their money in smart ways to be agents of change in the world. He still stands as an island of, of innovation and commitment to a set of ideals, despite what a lot of people in the world think, to using the unusual sort of resources of, of one very successful individual to, to become a, a force of change in the world. Most billionaires are building their 13th house or buying their seventh yacht, you know, and it's, it's frustrating. 
because there's an enormous amount of capital that could be mobilized for positive change, whether it's health or education or the environment. It doesn't have to be, you know, open society. There, there are many things that could be done. And then on the other side, as you say, there are non-state actors who, who have, I would say, nefarious purposes, violent purposes in some cases, uh, like the Islamic State. And those are certainly showing a nimbleness and a force which is startling and not surprising if we view them as sort of the negative echoes of the same nimbleness and techniques of some on the more positive side, their use of technology, their ability to organize informally, the depth of commitment <coughs> that their members have, their ability to reach across borders in surprising ways to find sort of communities of support. You know, they're, they're echoes of things we've seen on the transnational NGO side that are echoed by them with a dark character. So I think we will continue to see that as a, as a significant issue or problem. Um, in my capacity as a super empowered individual sitting in this chair, we've uh, got five minutes, so should we just have the last couple of questions? There was this gentleman here and then the gentleman in the red t-shirt. Okay, I'm Chen Bo from Department of Political Science. So I'd like to make two observations. Like you said earlier, the Europe, like uh, West, I also see itself as the center of democracy, the center of the radiating center, giving all the ideas to rise, but actually it's not the, the case in many parts of the world. So before the Second World War, Japan, the Japanese nationalism was the model, was the most popular ideology in the whole of Asia. And still today, like the, all the nation states were the legacy of the Japanese empire back in the Second World War. And later, communism has been, maybe not more, but as, more, as attractive as labor democracy during all of the 1960s, 70s. Then later today, like in Asia, even like Singapore is a small country, but the model of Singapore has been very attractive both to the smaller neighbors and even to China. China sends a lot of officials to Singapore to learn the Singapore way of, of administration. And the first part, so like we have all these regional very models that is, they have been um, supporting or uh, supplying all these kind of ideology from the beginning in, in, in addition to the West or just in place of West. The second part is like the West always see democracy as such an attractive idea as the only selling point. So for the people who are from non-Western uh, world, so sometimes we are not really looking for democracy, but we rebrand our name as democracy. So like it's exactly people who like me, like uh, who talk both to <coughs> other part and the West. So when there's people doing some movement, and I want money from the West, they are trying to rebrand the market as a democratic movement, so I will get supported. So like what's going on in Syria, what's going on in Burma, the reform, like whether it's a democratic movement is questionable, but the actors rebrand their movement as a democratic movement, so they will get support. Yeah. Yeah. The gentleman with that t-shirt. Um, I'm John from the Department of Public Policy here. Um, and from what you said earlier, um, at the moment there is such a plurality of actors involved in any state which is in transition, and they don't necessarily, those states might not necessarily Western democracy as, as a more legitimate um, proposal for them. And uh, in the face of these states who are maybe possibly more free to use more underhanded tactics to further their interests and have a more sustained, like the group one states, a more sustained uh, program of uh, promoting their interests, um, should the focus still be on democracy support, if that will just exacerbate the situation of political flux um, causing things like civil wars? Um, like can it still be justified in those cases? <coughs> Or should the goal shift to just promoting a peaceful resolution or uh, consolidating whatever sovereignty a nation might still have to make a decision free of outside actors? And would that maybe go some way into re-legitimizing Western democracy and the Western worldview if, the, if it was more about promoting uh, sovereignty rather than democracy? Those are the two longest questions with the shortest amount of time to answer them. So. Okay, let me take the second one first. Um, I think that uh, I wouldn't overstate the idea that democracy support is simply resulting in conflict in lots of places. There is a lot of conflict in the world in the last 15 or 20 years. 
a significant share of it comes from the breakup of certain sort of larger empires, formal, informal, like the Soviet Union or, the, or Yugoslavia or multinational enterprises that broke up and produced a lot of conflict as a result, or certain African states that when they lost the authoritarian hand that was keeping together a rather sort of badly run, sort of messy nation state broke, you know, broke into conflict in some ways. I don't, I've said over the years that when you blame democracy for something like the Civil War in Congo and say, they were fine as long as they had an authoritarian, and then once they tried democracy, they had civil war. Uh, I think it's a simplistic explanation because the people in the country, authoritarianism failed the country and fell apart and left the country in a terrible condition, which makes it hard to function as a unified country. And to put the blame, the blame for that on democracy is, is a mistaken step in logic. But it is true, I would say, that the case of Libya has, has woken people up to the fact that there isn't a more vivid case, and it's no coincidence that in his interview with the super-empowered uh, individual Tom Friedman recently in the New York Times, President Obama's one regret that he expressed in foreign policy was not responding to the Libyan transition adequately to help ensure the emergence of a coherent Libyan state. That that has been a sobering example of what looked like a foreign policy success in helping to oust an authoritarian leader, leading to something uh, that's pretty terrible in its place. Um, but uh, like I say, I would be careful about overstating the idea that democracy promotion is simply leading to a lot of bad things in a lot of countries. I agree very much with your point. That was sort of what I was trying to refer to, that Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and East Asia has not experienced a sort of single impulse or direction of change in the way that Central and Eastern Europe did for a while, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and in some extent parts of the Arab world recently. Asia instead, as you said, has been the source of many different sort of political ideas and political impulses, and it's hard to say even that there was a democratic wave throughout Asia. There were some countries you know, that have made democratic transitions like South Korea, others that are in very consolidated authoritarian rule, and some that are in civil conflict. So I agree with you that the influence of Japan, the influence of China, the unusual Singapore model, and a number of other cases like the South, South Korea's economic success uh, are all weigh very heavily on the minds of Asians and lead to complicated thinking about the relationship of political goals to economic goals, and there's no any attempt to reduce Asian politics to a democratic lens would, would be a, a gross oversimplification. Thank you very much, Professor Thomas Carruthers, for your <laughs> speech this evening. And I think in a, a kind of pledge we should all take tonight in memory of this speech is that we never use the word transition. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah.